Hello everyone, uh, my name is Jesus Torresillas and today we are going to be talking about optimization, optimal control, trajectory optimization and splines. So the outline we are going to follow throughout the presentation is this one. We will first start by talking about optimization where we are going to define what an objective function is, what the constraints are and then we are going to be talking about the, a property called convexity and uh, we will also classify these convex optimization problems in different types. Then we will jump into optimal control. We will see the similarities and differences with respect to a standard optimization problem. Uh, and we will explain a very important optimal control example called linear quadratic regulator, LQ, LQR. Uh, and then we, were, uh, we are gonna be talking about uh, different methods to solve more complex problems, specifically direct and indirect methods. And finally, uh, we are going to talk a little bit about splines, so different representations of these splines, and also about one important property that they have that is called the convex hull property. Perfect. So with this outline, let's start with the first part of this tutorial, which is going to be about optimization. So an optimization problem has this form. In an optimization problem, we want to minimize an objective function, in this case f sub 0, subject to these constraints over here. So these constraints say that the, uh, the decision variable, that in this case is x, when evaluated in this S f sub i function, that value needs to be less or equal than zero. And here we have m constraints in total. So with these constraints, we can define what the feasible set is. So a feasible set is the set of points that satisfy all the constraints. So just the set of points x such that f sub i of x is less or equal than zero for all the constraints. With these definitions, now we can define what the optimal point of an optimization problem is or what the solution of this uh, optimization problem is, which is a point x star that belongs to the feasible set and then is able to achieve an objective value that is uh, less or equal than the objective value achieved by all the other points in the feasible set. Okay? So with these definitions, let, let's look at uh, two examples of uh, optimization problems. For example, imagine you have this case over here where in this blue shape you have the objective function and then this circle over here is going to be the feasible set. So in this case the decision variable x is a, a, it's a vector with two elements, right? So with x1 and x2. And we want to find the point in this feasible set that achieves the lowest objective value. So as you can see the optimal point in this case is this uh, yellow circle over here because it's the point of the um, feasible set that is able to achieve the lowest objective value. Uh, similarly, we can look at a different example where in this case the objective fun function is this one in red. We have a feasible set that is this shape over here and that means that the optimal point would be for example this point because it's the point that is able to achieve the lowest objective value. Now, there is a very important difference between these two functions in the sense that if you look at this function, this function looks like a bowl, so it's curved up all the time. While this function over here, there are some places where it's curved up, while in other places it's curved down. And this difference is something that is called convexity, and that's what we are going to study in the following slide. So first of all, let's define what a convex function is. So the, the mathematical definition is this one over here. That essentially says that in a convex function, if we take any pair of points x and y, and then we draw a segment between those points, then all the points of that segment will lie above the function. Okay, so you can see that this green segment lies above all the points of the function that are between the first point and the second point. In a non-convex function, that's not the case in the sense that we can find a pair of points for which uh, the segments, the uh, points that lie in that segment, lie below the points or some points that belong to the function. So for example, all these points of the function lie above this segment over here. So this is a 2D uh, case, but then you can uh, do this for any dimension, and here you see more examples. So this will be a convex uh, function, and this will be a non-convex function. Now, we can define also convexity for sets, and in this case, a set is going to be convex if for any pair of points x and y, the segment that goes from one of the points to the other one lies completely within the set. Okay? So again, this is the mathematical definition. 
but the intuition is here. So you can see that if you could take this point and this point, the segment lies completely within the set. In a convex case, this is not true in the sense that we can find a pair of points, X and Y, for which the corresponding segment lies outside the set. And again, we can do this for any dimension, and here you have two other examples. So this will be a convex set. Specifically, this is the positive semi-definite cone, and this will be a non-convex set. Right, so with these two definitions, now we can define what a convex optimization problem is. So a convex optimization problem is an optimization problem that has the following form. We want to minimize this objective function subject to these two constraints. But the main requirement is that all these functions, so the objective function f sub 0, and all the functions that are used in these constraints need to be convex functions. Okay? And then we can, have all, we can also have this equality constraint, but this equality constraint need to be, or needs to be an affine constraint. So for example, if you have an equality constraint that is quadratic, then for sure that's not going to be a convex optimization problem. Okay? The equality constraint needs to be an affine function. Now, there is one subtlety here in this definition. So the way we have defined a convex optimization problem, we have defined it such that, uh, or uh, making sure that all these functions, f sub 0 to f sub m, are convex functions. So this implies that the feasible set is going to be convex. And of course, that the objective function is going to be convex as well. But the other way around is not true. In other words, if you have a feasible set that is convex and you have a convex objective function, it may happen or it may be the case that the problem is not convex, right? Because maybe the feasible set is defined with functions f sub i that are actually not convex, okay? So this is just one subtlety, but it's important to know it and you can actually read a deeper, deeper explanation of this fact in this book over here. Great, so with this definition of what a convex optimization problem is, let's uh, study now different types of optimization problems. And let's start first with the, probably the simplest one, which is called a linear program. So in a linear program, we are minimizing a linear function. So this is just the inner product between this constant, uh, with this vector, which is constant, and the decision variable x, subject to these two linear constraints, right? So here everything is linear, both the objective function and the constraints, and that's why this is called a linear program. Now, what happens if we include a quadratic objective function? So if we include a quadratic objective function like this one, then we end up with a quadratic program. One important thing here is that this matrix P needs to be positive semi-definite. And this is to ensure that this objective function is like a bowl, so it's curved up, and therefore it's convex. If this P is not a positive semi-definite, then this is not a quadratic program. This will not be a convex quadratic program. It may be not convex. Um, and remember that the definition of a positive semi-definite matrix is that uh, we have a matrix that on one hand is symmetric and on the other hand, all the eigenvalues are non-negative. Now, what happens if we include a quadratic constraint like this one? So then we will have a quadratically constrained quadratic program, QC, QP. And again, here we need this P to be positive semi-definite and also all these P sub i's to be positive semi-definite as well. We can include other types of constraints, for example, this constraint over here, uh, which is called a second order uh, cone constraint, and therefore this uh, program, this uh, optimization problem, will be a second order cone program, or SOCP. We can also include a semi-definite constraint that looks something like this. In this constraint, we are imposing that the sum of all these symmetric matrices, matrices F weighted with the elements of the decision variable, that sum need to be a positive semi-definite matrix. Okay? So this is a semi-definite constraint, and therefore uh, this is called a semi-definite program. Note also that this constraint over here uh, sometimes is also called a linear matrix inequality. And finally, uh, we can uh, impose a, a more general constraint like this one, where we are for forcing the decision variable to lie in this convex cone K. So this will be a cone program. Now, the natural question is, okay, we have seen many different uh, convex optimization problems in this slide. 
what's the rela relationship between all these problems. So the thing is that all these problems are related because, uh, for example, a linear program is going to be just a specific case of a quadratic program. A QP will be a specific case of a QCQP. A QCQP will be a specific case of a SOCP, a second order cone program, which is going to be a specific case of an SDP, which is a specific case of a CP, of a cone program. And the best way to visualize this is using a diagram like this, where again, you can see that, for example, a QP, which is this circle over here, is going to be a specific case of a quadratically constrained quadratic program and also a specific case of a second order cone program and so on. And all these programs, all the cone programs in green, are going to be convex programs and all of them are optimization programs. Okay? So why is, this, why is it important to know this relationship? Well, two reasons. The first one is that in general, uh, the uh, closer you are to the center, to the linear program, the easier the problem is in general. Uh, and then uh, it's also important to know this relationship because imagine you have a library that is able to solve SDPs, right? Then you know for sure that that library is also able to solve LPs, QPs, QCQPs, and uh, second order cone programs, SOCPs, right? Because all these cases are just specific cases of an SDP, okay? I'm not saying that that's the best idea in the sense that, for example, if you have an LP, you should prob probably use an LP solver instead of an SDP solver, okay? Because an LP solver is going to be much faster than an SDP solver. But that doesn't mean that you cannot solve an LP with an SDP. You could do it if you wanted to. Great. So with these definitions, let's start or let's see now uh, at some specific examples. So imagine I give you this program where we are minimizing a linear function, C transpose x, subject to the decision variable being in this polygon, in this uh, polyhedron here, over here. So this is just uh, an LP, and the reason uh, for this is that, again, the objective function is linear, and this constraint uh, is going to be linear as well. So this constraint will be something like Ax less or equal than b. If we do this in 3D, it's the same story. In this case, we force x to be in this visible set over here, which is also a polyhedron, and therefore this is also going to be a linear program. Now, if we include a quadratic objective function like this one, is subject to the same constraint as before, then this will be a QP, a quadratic program, and if we impose a quadratic constraint, like a paraboloid over here, then this will be a QC, QP, quadratically constrained, quadratic program. Uh, we can do also the intersection between a quadratic constraint, like, a, like an ellipsoid, and a linear constraint, like a polyhedron, and this is also a QC, QP, a quadratically constrained, quadratic program. We can impose second order cone constraints like this one, and this will be a second order cone program. And we can also uh, force x to be in the positive semi definite cone, which is this one over here, and therefore this uh, uh, problem over here will be an SDP, a semi definite program. Uh, and this is an example combining many of the constraints before, so this is just the intersection of a polyhedron, an ellipsoid, a second order cone, and a PSD cone. And therefore, this will also be an SDP, a semi-definite program. Great. So with all these examples, I guess the questions that the question that we may ask now is uh, how can we actually solve these problems, right? So the good news is that if you want to solve uh, these problems, there are already many solvers that people have created uh, that are specific for different types of problems, right? So for example, if you want to solve a linear program, you can use these solvers over here. So CDD, GLPK, CLP, and so on. If you want to solve, let's say, a quadratic program, you can use OSQP or Gurobi and so on. And here in red, you have a, like very common solvers that people typically use. So for example, for linear programming, GLPK is pretty common. For quadratic programming, both OSQP and also Gurobi are uh, pretty common uh, and so on. So this will be for second order programs, uh, for SDPs, uh, and so on. And then the solvers that you have here are for uh, general nonlinear programs. So you could apply or you could use these solvers for, uh, for example, non-convex programs. So IPOPT and Nitro are two common solvers that are used for these non-convex settings. 
Now, what happens if you have a specific problem and then you want to, you know, you want to try it first with GLPK, then you would like to try uh, it with LP Solve, then with this other solver and so on. Do you actually need to code it differently from uh, to just change the solver? The answer is no, because some people have created uh, something called an interface that uh, what these interfaces do is they allow you to easily switch between different solvers. In other words, imagine you have an optimization problem like this one, then you just use one of these interfaces that by changing one line of code allow you to choose solver one, solver two, or solver n. And therefore, you don't have to code the optimization problem specifically for each one of the solvers. So there are many interfaces. Uh, here I have just included two uh, common ones. So one is YALMIP, is in MATLAB, and all the solvers supported by this interface are actually all the solvers that I showed before in this slide. The second interface is called CBXPy, it's in Python, and the focus of this interface is on convex optimization problems, and the solvers supported are the ones that appear in this table over here. And with that, uh, we conclude the first part of the tutorial, and now we are going to start talking about optimal control. So, let's see, so far we have talked about optimization problems in which we had a, a finite set of decision variables, right? So now in this optimal control problem, that's going to change. So an optimal control problem will look something like this. And the most important part here is that we are minimizing over trajectories, right? Or functions in general. Uh, so that means that we will have infinitely, infinitely many decision variables. Uh, another important difference is that one of the constraints is going to be a, a differential equation that describes the dynamics of the robot, of a robot, for example, and then we have these uh, constraints regarding the initial and final states. If we look now at the cost, uh, you can see that this cost is going to be a functional, which by definition is a function of functions, right? Because this is a function that depends on these functions over here, x of t and u of t. And this cost in general will have two terms, the first term is the final cost and is called the Meyer term. And the second term is called the Lagrange term, which is a running cost from the initial time to the final time. And just a note here, so there are actually many uh, different formulations uh, of this problem. And there are formulations that are way more general than this one. But for now, for this tutorial, I'm just going to stick with this uh, simple formulation. So uh, if you do the math, uh, you will find out that the to uh, obtain the necessary conditions for this problem, right? you want to obtain the necessary, condi the necessary conditions that these two trajectories need to satisfy uh, in an optimal, uh, for, a, for them to be optimal. Okay? So you will realize that the first thing that you need to find is the Hamiltonian, which is J, J plus P transpose F. So J is this function that appears inside the integral, P is going to be something called the co-state, and then F is the function that is used in the dynamics. Okay, so G plus P transpose F will be will be the Hamiltonian. Now, once you have the Hamiltonian, the necessary conditions are these ones over here. So on one hand, you want the you want to satisfy the dynamics, so this constraint is trivial, x dot equals F. So this constraint over here, and you can uh, see that f is actually the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to the co-state. Here we are using this notation. So a subscript means that we are taking the partial derivative with respect to that variable. Then the second necessary condition is that the derivative of the co-state with respect to time, so this value over here, needs to be equal to minus the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to the state x. And then finally, the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to the input needs to be equal to zero. So as you can see, these necessary conditions uh, contain two differential equations, these two ones, for which we actually need, uh, you know, either initial or, or final conditions to be able to integrate these differential equations. And these conditions are shown here. Uh, and then if the final time, this tf, is a decision variable, in other words, if this final time is free, then you need to impose this transversability condition. Okay, so these are just the necessary conditions. Uh, to prove these necessary conditions, 
you need something called calculus of variations that we are not going to cover in this tutorial. But yeah, for anyone interested, you can check it out. It's called calculus of variations. Great. So now let's focus on a particular case. So this is kind of the general setting, right? But, but now let's assume that this function h and this function g are actually quadratic in the states and the inputs. And then we will also assume now that these uh, dynamics are linear. In other words, we end up with a problem that looks like this, where the cost is going to be quadratic. This is the final cost and this is the running cost. And then we have these dynamics that are linear dynamics, right? So then we can, uh, you know, do the math using the necessary conditions and you will find out that to find the optimal input for this problem, you have to do three steps. The first step is that you need to solve something called the differential Riccati equation, DRE for short. So this is a differential equation in which we need to find this variable P of T. So P of T is going to be a matrix and this differential equation will, uh, will um, explain or will enforce how this matrix evolves over time. So as any differential equation, we need a final or initial condition. In this case, uh, this is a final condition. So the matrix P, when evaluated at the final time, needs to be equal to this value PF, which is the matrix that appears here. So that means that this differential equation is integrated backwards from the final time to the initial time. Once we have the evolution of P as a function of time, we can obtain the optimal input by simply doing minus K of T times X. So here K is going to be the, pro the product of these three matrices, where P of T is the matrix we have found before. And the most important thing to note here is that this optimal solution is going to be a full state feedback in the sense that here we are just taking the state, we are multiplying it by this uh, matrix K of T and then putting this minus one here and that gives us the optimal input. Okay, so the optimal input is a full state feedback. And now if we want to uh, find out how the states evolve over, over time, that's pretty easy because we have that x dot equals ax plus bu. And now we already know what u is, which is this value, uh, value over here. So that means that the closed loop system will evolve uh, according to this differential equation. x dot equals a minus bk times x of t. And then you can also prove that the optimal cost of this problem is given by this expression here. And the cost to go for a or at any point in time is given by this second expression here. 1 over 2 x transpose p x. Great. So in this problem, uh, you can see that this matrix over here, this one over here, this one over here, a and b, all of them depend on time. Now the question is, uh, what happens if they actually don't depend on time, right? So imagine that you have a case where these matrices don't depend on time, that's on one hand, and then the other thing that we have changed is that we have put an infinity here, right? So this is the infinite horizon LQR. So if I go back to the previous slide, here this TF was a finite value, and now this is going to be infinity. So you can do the math, and you will find out that the steps needed are pretty similar to the previous case, but with one key difference. So in this case, we don't have the differential Riccati equation, but instead we have something called the control algebraic Riccati equation, SCARE, C-A-R-E. And this is just an algebraic equation that in general is much, much easier to solve than the differential Riccati equation. And actually in MATLAB and Python, you can uh, find many uh, functions that do this for you, that if you uh, just uh, use or the specific A, uh, Rxx, B, and Ruu that you have in your problem, then they give you back the value P of this equation. So once you solve this uh, Riccati equation, this control algebraic Riccati equation, then you just use the same formulas as before. So this will be the optimal input, and then the closed loop system will be x dot equals a minus bk times x of t. Okay? Great. So let's do now one example. So imagine I give you this example over here where we want to minimize this uh, a final cost, which is quadratic, right? Plus this integral from 0 to 10 of this uh, Lagrange term. 
right? So this second term will be the Lagrange term, and this first term will be the Meyer term. Uh, and then the dynamics are given by this equation over here, where A is this matrix and B is going to be this matrix, okay? So the first thing that you need to note here is that this value here is finite, okay? And that means that we will probably, or we will have to solve the differential Riccati equation, okay? So if we do that, we take the differential Riccati equation, we have this final condition where PF is this matrix over here, and we can integrate this differential equation backwards, right? So we take the final values of this P matrix, and that means that we have to take those values and integrate them through the differential equation, okay? And you obtain that the P of, that P of T, this matrix, the, the elements of this matrix will evolve according to these curves over here. The blue one, this one, the yellow one, and then this red one. Once we have P of T, we can compute the gain matrix, K of T, uh, which evolves according to these two curves, the red one and then the blue one, right? And then the optimal input will be simply be minus K of T times the state, X of T. Now, in these plots, uh, I have also uh, plotted other things, right? So I have plotted both the solution to the differential required equation, which are these curves that I have explained before, but also the solution to the steady state uh, Riccati equation, right? So to the control algebraic Riccati equation. Those, the solution uh, for that control algebraic Riccati equation is given by these horizontal lines, right? Because they are constant. So this one, this one, and this one. And same for the gain matrix K. Uh, so as you can see, for most part of the trajectory, the steady state solution, right? When this Tf is infinity, the, that solution is actually pretty, pretty similar to the solution of the finite horizon LQR, right? Which are, or which is given by these curves over here. And this is going to be true under some assumptions that I'm not going to explain here, but uh, under those assumptions, you can prove that the matrix P, the solution of the differential Riccati equation, will tend to the solution of the control algebraic Riccati equation, which is constant, okay? Uh, yeah, and then actu I actually uploaded all the code here, so you can play around with this example if you want. So now, uh, I mean, that was good. We were able to solve that LQ LQR problem, but uh, more in general, how can we solve more complex problems, right? Because the, all these problems, we had these dynamics, for example, that were linear, and then we had this quadratic cost. But we will probably have many robots or many different systems for which these uh, conditions don't hold, right? So first of all, let, let me uh, give you just a reminder on numerical integration. So there is something called the trapezoidal rule that is used to approximate an integral of a, of a function. So if you want to compute this integral over here, you can approximate that integral by, a, you know, just drawing a straight line between the initial point and the final point. And then you say this first integral, which is the area below the blue curve, is going to be similar to the area below the red curve, which is actually pretty easy to compute and it's given by this formula over here. So this is something called the trapezoidal rule. And as you can see, you need to evaluate the function only at the beginning and at the end. Then there is another rule called the Simpson rule that is given by this equation, where we use a similar idea, but instead of using a straight line, what we do is we use a quadratic function. So in this case, we approximate the area below the blue curve with the area below the red curve whose formula is given by this equation over here. In this case, we need to evaluate the function uh, at three, point, three different points at the beginning, at the end, and also at the middle. Okay. Great, so with this uh, brief reminder on numerical integration, let's try to answer the question of how to solve more complex problems. So in general, there are two methods to do this. One method uh, or one category is called direct methods, where the idea is that we first discretize the problem and then we optimize it. In other words, you take the optimal control problem, where again, we are minimizing over infinitely many decision variables. You do something called transcription, where the idea is that we discretize this problem and we go for, from infinitely many decision variables 
to a finite set of decision variables, right? So this is going to be a standard nonlinear program, and therefore we can call a, a NLP solver to obtain this discrete solution. And then we will do something called interpolation to go from this discrete solution to a continuous solution. Okay, so within direct methods, there are two main types. The first one uh, is called uh, shooting, so shooting methods, and the second type will be collocation methods. The main difference between these two methods is the decision variables used for the nonlinear program. So in shooting methods, the decision variables will be all the controls and the boundary states. On the other hand, in collocation methods, the decision variables for the nonlinear program will be all the controls and also all the states. Right? So the reason why shooting methods don't need to add all the states uh, as decision variables is because the way they work is by doing something called explicit integration. In other words, what they do is they simulate the differential equation and therefore they can remove all the states from the decision variables because they will be functions of the controls. Okay? So you express all the states as functions of the, con as a functions of the controls and therefore you can remove these states from the decision variables. On the other hand, collocation methods, they include both controls and states, and therefore they need to include some constraints to uh, enforce the relationship between the controls and the states. Right? So within shooting methods, you can do something called single shooting or multiple shooting. So in single shooting, what you do is you simulate once, so you just do one trajectory segment, you simulate the system, and then you need to impose a one defect constraint to remove this gap over here. In multiple shooting methods, what you do essentially is you do single shooting multiple times. So you take the trajectory and you divide it into several intervals and for each interval you perform single shooting, which means that you will have to impose all these defect constraints over here. Within collocation, we can talk about a trapezoidal methods, where in this case the control will be linear splines, uh, the state will be quadratic, and then these methods, they use the trapezoidal rule, which is what we saw in the previous slide. Then there are also Hermit-Simpson methods, where in this case the control will be a quadratic spline, and the state will be a cubic spline, and this is something that uses the Simpson rule. And finally, we have orthogonal methods, where uh, the idea here is that each segment will be a higher or a higher order uh, orthogonal polynomial. So all these methods are direct methods where, again, the idea is that we first discretize the problem and then we optimize it. In indirect methods, we do it the other way around. In other words, we first optimize the problem, uh, and by this I mean that we analytically construct the necessary conditions for the solution to be optimal, and then we numerically solve uh, those necessary conditions by discretizing the differential equations that we obtain. Okay? And you can do this uh, also using single, single shooting or multiple shooting. So we are not going to cover these ones. Uh, we are going to focus on these direct methods. And specifically, what we are going to do is we are going to do an example using the trapezoidal method, which is a collocation method and which is a direct method as well. So let's do this simple example. So in this example, we want to move this block from this starting location to this goal location. We want to do this in one unit of time, let's say one second. We want to move one meter from zero to one, but the velocity at the beginning and the velocity at the end needs, uh, need to be uh, zero uh, at both places. So, I mean, the answer is that there are many feasible trajectories that are able to achieve this, and these are just some cases. So all these trajectories over here go from zero meters to one meter in one second, and all of them have initial and final velocities of uh, zero, because you can see that the slope is completely zero. But the thing is that we're in interested in finding the trajectory that minimizing, minimizes sorry, the integral of the force squared. Okay? So to do that, we need to write down the uh, problem where we want to uh, minimize the integral from 0 to 1 second of the squared of the acceleration. Here we assume that the block uh, has a mass of 1 kilogram and therefore the acceleration and the force are the same. 
Um, so with this uh, cost function, we want to uh, you know, minimize it subject to these constraints over here. So on one hand, we have that the position, the derivative of the position will be the velocity, and the, the derivative of the velocity will be the acceleration. So these two equations over here are the dynamics of the problem. Then we'll have these initial and final conditions, and then the decision variables will be the states, which are the position and the velocity, and the input, which is u of t, the acceleration. Okay, so this is an optimal control problem where, again, we are minimizing over infinitely many decision variables. Now, let's use the trapezoidal rule to uh, convert this optimal control problem to a standard nonlinear program. So to do that, we need to discretize time. So we take the total time and we discretize it in several discretization steps. And we do the same for the uh, states and the, the, sorry, for the position and the, the velocity. And we end up with a problem that looks like this. So we take the objective function, this integral, and we approximate this integral using the trapezoidal integration rule, which is the one we saw before. And you can prove that this term over here will, uh, will uh, produce this uh, cost function over here. Okay? You do the same for the differential equations. So you go from these continuous differential equations to these algebraic equations. And finally, you do the same for the initial and final conditions, which are much simpler. And the good news is that here, if you look at this problem, this is just a quadratic program. So this is something that you can, you know, just call a QP solver, for example, Gurobi or any other QP solver, and then obtain this discrete solution. Okay? And once you have that discrete solution, you do something called spline interpolation, where you go from this discrete set of uh, decision variables uh, to a, a trajectory that will be continuous using this interpolation. Perfect. So the good news now is that there is actually a lot of software out there that uh, already solves all these problems uh, for you. Uh, so here I have just included some famous ones. For example, GPAPS, GPAPS uh, 2 is a pretty famous one. It's in MATLAB. Uh, ACADOS is becoming more and more famous, especially for embedded systems, because it's able to produce C code specifically for a, for a given problem. CASAD is also pretty common and pretty famous. Uh, is, it has all the building blocks that you will need to do the transcription and then to call the solver. And here you have other, uh, other famous ones, all these uh, optimal control solvers. And just as an example, uh, this is an example where we uh, use GPAPS2 to uh, optimize a trajectory of the trajectory of the drone to make it pass through all the gates while minimizing a weighted sum of the total time plus the energy that the, drones, the drone uses. So if you code this, pro uh, this problem in MATLAB and you call GPAPS, you will find out this solution over here. So the drone is able to pass through all the gates while minimizing the total time of the trajectory and also the energy that it consumes. And if you want to play around with the code, all the code is here in this repo. Perfect. So a little bit of terminology now, because this can be a, a little bit confusing in the literature. So people typically refer to trajectory optimization when they solve an optimal control problem for a specific initial condition, right? So imagine that you fix the initial condition and then you solve the optimization problem. That will give you a result that is an open loop solution, right? Because you specified the initial condition as fixed. Now, the interesting thing is that if you are able to solve this trajectory optimization problem uh, fast enough, then you can actually uh, generate a closed loop solution, right? So the idea is that you iteratively solve these optimization problems all the time. And that's uh, something that MPC does, model predictive control. So in MPC, the idea is that we take an optimal control problem, we solve it from the current condition, we execute the first step of the optimal trajectory that we have found, and then we iterate, okay? So let me explain this in detail. And this is something that uh, is used a lot in robotics. So imagine you are in this environment and you want to go from this starting location to this go location with a robot. So what you will do 
is uh, you will run a path planning algorithm like this one, like for example, a star or RRT, whatever, and you obtain this piecewise linear path over here that typically minimizes distance. So path planning uh, focuses on creating this piecewise linear path that is typically long-term from the starting location to the goal location, and that gives the general direction that the robot should follow, right? And in general, this path planning uh, will minimize the distance, usually. Now, what happens if I ask you to use one of these robots, like this one, or maybe this drone, maybe this uh, robot with wheels, or even this uh, the robot over here, which has both legs and wheels, and I ask you to take one of these robots and try to follow this path. So you will find out that for some of these robots, they actually need to, you know, they are moving in this direction, they will have to stop in this corner, turn, and then continue moving, right? Which is not ideal. And that's where trajectory optimization comes in. So in trajectory optimization, what we do is we follow the direction that the global plan, the path a planning algorithm, indicates to the robot, right? So we know, if we are here, we know that we need to move in this direction, and that's the direction uh, that the trajectory optimization algorithm will use. This is going to be something that is typically short term. So we optimize, you know, maybe for five meters, but not from the starting location to the goal location in general. And here we are taking into account the dynamics of the robot, right? Because we are included the including the differential equation that couples the states and the input. Then in the cost function, we can minimize the energy, the time, the distance, or a weighted sum of these things. And this is something that, as I said before, is typically solved iteratively in, in an MPC fashion. And just uh, let me explain to uh, you what a model predictive control is. So as I was uh, saying before, in model predictive control, we, for example, have an input, we have some measurements, and we solve an optimal control problem, right? Now, the solution of this problem is going to be a trajectory that goes from T0 to Tf. So all this green part uh, of this green trajectory over here. Now, in MPC, what we do is we take this optimal trajectory and we only implement this first part, okay? So we take the first part of the trajectory and we implement it in the robot. So the robot moves and then we measure again, we take the new input if it has, if it has changed and then we solve another optimization problem. We take the first part of the optimal trajectory, we implement it and so on and we iterate. So if you draw this in this diagram, it looks something like this. So for each iteration, we obtain the optimal trajectory, but we implement only the first part of the trajectory, which is this one. Great, so with that, we finished the second part of the tutorial, and now we are going to talk about splines, which is the third and last part of the tutorial. So why uh, did I include splines in this tutorial? The thing is that splines are used internally in many optimal control solvers, especially when they do, you know, this interpolation to go from the solution of the uh, NLP, of the nonlinear program, to obtain a continuous solution, they typically use splines under the hood. Then for some specific robots, such as drones, you can actually prove that a spline trajectory is going to be dynamically feasible under some assumptions, but uh, that's generally true for drones, and this is something called differential flatness. Uh, and then the last uh, reason why this, uh, why splines are important is because they are, they, they are used a lot in obstacle avoidance because they have a property called the convex hull property that makes them very, very appealing for this obstacle avoidance. And this is something that I'm going to explain in the following slides. Okay, so what is a spline? So a spline is going to be a function defined piecewise by polynomials. In other words, in this case, for example, you have a function or a trajectory with n intervals, and this function or this trajectory will be a spline if each one of these segment of these segments is a polynomial. So this will be one polynomial, another polynomial, and so on. Okay. So now each segment of this uh, trajectory can be expressed as the sum of these two terms. Q sub i will be something that we will call control point, and then this term over here is a basis function, which is a polynomial, okay? So this segment over here, the first segment, will be the sum of the product of the control points times the basis functions. 
So depending on how you choose these basis functions, you can actually end up with different representations of the same spline. And this is very important. So the spline will be the same, it's just different ways of representing it. So there are many different representations. Here I have included three of them. So one is called B-splines, where we use basis functions that cover the whole trajectory. We are going to see some plots in the next slide. Then in a Bezier spline, which is also known as a composite a Bezier curve, the basis functions for each one of the segments are the Bernstein polynomials. And then in MIMVO splines, the basis functions will be the MIMVO basis polynomials. Okay? And let's look at one example. So imagine I give you this example. We have this spline over here, which is the same one in all these three cases. So all these three plots over here are representing the same trajectory, the same spline. Now, uh, the thing is that in each one of the representations, what we change is the basis functions. Okay? So in a B-spline, we use these basis functions. In a Bezier uh, spline, we use these basis functions. And in a Mimbo spline, we use these ones. Right? So for example, this segment over here will be, and here I'm going to use this formula, okay? So this segment over here will be equal to the first control point, which is going to be this vertex, times the first basis function, plus the second control point, which is going to be this vertex, times the second basis function, plus the third control point, which is this one, times the third basis function, okay? Now, if we go to the Bezier spline, we have the same story. So this segment over here will be equal to the first control point times the first basis function plus the second control point times the second basis function plus the third control point times the third basis function. Okay, and the same story for the MIMBO spline. As you can see, the only thing that we have changed here is the basis functions. So the spline itself is the same, but we have changed this lambda, lambda sub i of t, and that means that the control points, which are the vertices of these polygons, are going to change as well. So now, there is a, a very important a way to represent these splines, which is called the matrix representation. The idea is that, imagine this is the same spline as in the previous slide, the idea is that it, this spline, which in this case is a 2D spline, right, because we have X and Y, can be represented as a matrix V times a matrix A times a vector that depends on T, okay? So a matrix V will be a matrix in which the columns are the control points of the spline. Then the matrix A will depend only on the basis functions that we use. So this matrix A is known beforehand, and this is just the vector of times, okay? So let's look at the same example as before. Same spline for all the cases, and let's look at one of the representations. So in this case, P of T, which is going to be this second segment, will be equal to a matrix whose columns are the control points of that segment, times this matrix A, B, S, which is a matrix that is known beforehand and that it will define the basis functions, times this a vector of times, okay? But that segment, which is the same as this one, can be expressed as this other matrix, which con contains the Bezier control points, times this a basis matrix, times the vector of times. And same with the MIMBO spline. Again, these columns over here will be the MIMBO control points. Now, to evaluate uh, BS splines, uh, you should probably use this other algorithm called the, the Bur algorithm, which is uh, usually much, much faster than this matrix uh, representation. So, these are the basis functions. Uh, these are, this is for the MIMBO representation, the Bezier representation. So, these are the Bernstein polynomials, and this is the BS spline representation. Uh, so there are two important things to note here, and these uh, are these ones. So on one hand, all these basis functions uh, are non-negative polynomials, okay? So as you can see, they are always non-negative. And then the second impor important property is that these functions, these polynomials, they form a partition of unity. In other words, if you sum, for example, in this case, this blue function with this blue function, 
with this yellow function, the sum is going to be one, a constant one over here. And you can uh, see that that's true for all these cases. So if you sum these uh, four polynomials, you will, learn, you will find out that the sum is just one. Okay, And that's, that applies to all these cases. Now, these two properties are the reason why splines satisfy something called the convex hull property. So the convex hull property says that a specific segment of the trajectory is completely contained within the convex hull of the control points of that segment. Okay, so here the control points are this one, this one, and this one. Their convex hull is going to be this red triangle, and you can verify that the red segment lies completely within this convex hull. This is for a B spline. For a Bezier spline, that's also true. So these are the control points. And then this is the segment that is completely contained within this convex hull. And same applies for the MIMVO spline. And this is true for any dimension. So here we looked at uh, a 2D representation, a 2D spline, but this is also true for 3D splines. So in these splines, we have that the segment is this red, uh, red uh, curve over here. So this is one segment of the trajectory. And in this case, these are the four MIMBO control points. And you can see that the convex hull of these control points, which in this case is a tetrahedron, completely contains the segment of the trajectory. And same applies for the Bezier spline and for the B spline. If you want to look at some animation, uh, here you have one. So again, this is just one segment of the trajectory. And these are the tetrahedron, uh, the tetrahedra that are the convex hulls of the control points of its representation. Okay, so these four points over here are in this case the MIMBO control points. Okay, so why are splines used a lot in obstacle avoidance? The thing is that uh, in obstacle avoidance algorithms, you can actually leverage this convex hull property of these splines to be able to perform, uh, you know, obstacle avoidance uh, with very, very small computation time while ensuring safety at all times. And the way this works is as follows. Imagine you have a robot that is here at this starting location and you want it to go to this go location over here while avoiding the red obstacles. So one thing you could do is you do something called convex decomposition of the free space where you obtain a sequence of overlapping polyhedra that go from this starting location to the go location. Now, once you have this convex decomposition of the free space, you can do two things. One way will be to, you take the trajectory you want to optimize, you discretize it, and then you end up with all these discretization points, and then you force those points to be within this corridor that you have obtained. Okay, so for example, you impose that these three points over here belong to this uh, first polyhedron, and you do the same for all the other points. So the decision variables will be these green discretized points. Now, the problem here is that safety is not guaranteed because we don't have a, or we don't know what's going to happen between two discretization points, right? So we know that this first point is inside this first polyhedron. We know that the second point is also inside this first polyhedron, but we don't know what happens in between. Maybe the trajectory goes out uh, the polyhedron and can hit one of the red obst obstacles. So that to make sure that this doesn't happen, you can actually leverage the convex hull property of the B splines, Bezier, or the MIMBO uh, representations. Where the idea here is that we force uh, all the points of all the segments of the trajectories of the trajectory to be within a specific polyhedron, and therefore you ensure that that segment will be completely contained uh, in that polyhedron. So in this case, the decision variables are the control points of each interval and the safety will be guaranteed because of the convex hull property. And this is something that you can do in position space, but you could also do in velocity and acceleration space. Imagine, for example, that you have velocity constraints or acceleration constraints. You can use this convex hull property to enforce those constraints. And this is just an example. Here you have a drone that is using this convex hull property and the splines to be able to perform obstacle avoidance in a very complex environment and doing this completely in real time. You can actually increase the complexity of the environment, including more heterogeneous dynamic obstacles, 
and still the drone is able to do this, to do this in real time while avoiding the, the obstacles. You can even include several agents. So in this case, all these agents are again using splines and the convex hull property to be able to perform obstacle avoidance between them, between the or with respect to the uh, static obstacles and also with respect to the dynamic obstacles. And finally, you can also uh, deploy this in hardware. So this is uh, these are some exam experiments where the drone needs to avoid this other dynamic obstacle over here while performing all the computation on board the drone. So all the computation is happening in the computer that the drone is equipped with. So again, this drone is using splines to solve these trajectory optimization problems and is uh, making use of this convex hull property to make sure that the trajectory, that the optimal trajectory does not collide with the obstacles. Perfect. Uh, so in this tutorial, we started talking about optimization, where we uh, covered, you know, what an objective function is, what the constraints are. Then we define convexity for an optimization problem, and then we explained different types of convex optimization problem problems together with the relationship between them. Then we started talking about optimal control. We saw, you know, the necessary conditions for an optimal for a trajectory to be optimal. Then we analyzed a very important case called the linear quadratic regulator, both in the finite horizon version and also in the infin infinite horizon version. And then we studied different methods to solve general optimal control problems. Specifically, we studied the direct and indirect methods. And then we did an example of a direct method called the trapezoidal method. And finally, we also covered splines where we studied different representations, via spline, Bezier, and Mimbo, and we also explained what the convex hull property of these splines is. And with this, I would like just to thank you so much uh, for your attention. These are the references in case you want to uh, you know, read more, more about these topics. And yeah, thank you so much.